So last week the lovely people at Shergold Guitars sent me this to try out, which is nice, and I'm going to be telling you a bit more about this guitar later on, but I thought because Bernard Sumner in his Joy Division period was known for using one of the original Shergold guitars, I thought this would be the perfect excuse for me to look at another Joy Division track. And the song I've chosen is New Dawn Fades from the Unknown Pleasures LP, and before we go any further I'm just going to have a bit of a play. I'm not going to play the entire song for you because it's five minutes long and without Ian Curtis on lead vocals that might get a little bit boring, but I'm going to whiz you through the guitar highlights, then I'm going to take you through how to play it. So there we are, I think this is a fabulous song. Also I think there's some fabulous guitar stuff going on here. And I know that Bernard Sumner sometimes comes in for criticism for not being a particularly technically adept player, but I think he's a great guitar player and those that criticise him are probably missing the point of his style of playing and of this style of music entirely. Now, there are lots of great riffs going on here. Most of this stuff is pretty easy to play, which makes this song perfect both for beginners and for more experienced players as well. So let's take a look. We are loosely in the key of E minor for this song and it's one of those songs where it's just the same chords repeated for the entire song and we're kicking off with the drums and bass in the intro. The bass line is doing something like this. We've got E going down to D down to C and then to A and the chords that are being implied there are I think E minor just descending D, C, and then A minor. And I think it's just worth bearing those basic chords in mind as you're working on this song. Now the guitar comes in and we've got this great riff all played on the low E string and that goes like this. And 
nice and easy to play. I'm just going to call out the fret numbers for you here. We've just got open low E string and then two, three, five, seven, five, three, five, seven, five, three, two, three, open. play most of that with one finger and if you keep the pressure down you just get these little slides in between some of those notes happening. The next riff is this one. Uh, again this is super simple it's just two notes we've got the low E and then we've got this F sharp note at the second fret so we're going E, E, F sharp and we're doing that again and then E, F sharp, so... And on that F sharp you can just give it a little bit of vibrato or a little bit of a bend. Um, what I decided to do is the first time I play the F sharp I'm giving it some vibrato. And then the next time I'm just pulling it slightly sharp. And doing the same thing at the end of the bar, so it's... Vibrato, then bend and bend. So we're repeating that four times, I think, and then we're just going to be taking that same riff up an octave. Still playing it on the low E string, we're just playing everything 12 frets higher. So we've got an E at the 12th fret an F sharp at the 14th fret and it's exactly the same riff. Not really hearing much bending or vibrato when he's playing it higher up the neck on the recording. And incidentally playing all of this with downstrokes. I think most of this song you should be digging in with nice aggressive downstrokes in your picking hand. So next we're on to this lovely clean arpeggio section of the song and I think this is the most difficult section of the song to play. Also for me was the most difficult section of the song to figure out because on the recording it's quite a murky mix and there are at least two guitars kind of doubled but not quite playing the same thing and there are effects so it's a little bit difficult to say exactly what Bernard Sumner is doing here but this is the way that I've chosen to do it. and. Um, Again, this is based on our descending chord progression and I think if you're a complete beginner you probably just want to keep it nice and simple and base this part on a descending series of sus2 chords. So you could play an E sus2 and you can just bar uh, the highest five strings at the seventh fret and then we've got the ninth fret on the D and the G. It's an E sus2 chord and you can just arpeggiate that chord. Then move that down to D sus2, C, and then A. And you can vary the, the right hand pattern a little bit. You can just go straight up and down the chord, or you can just vary it slightly. So that's one approach. Now if you want to get a little bit closer to what's happening on the record then it seems to me like Bernard Sumner is playing this mainly on the highest four strings and he's just developing and elaborating on those basic chords. So for the E sus2 part I'm going to play this. So I've got 9 and 9 on the D and the G and then I've got the 7th fret on the E and the B. Then I'm playing 8 and 10 on the B. Then I'm coming down, the, the basic chord is D or D sus2, but the part I'm playing is this. So I'm starting on the D string, 7 onto the G, 7. And I'm playing 7 to 8 on the B, 5 on the top string and then coming down that chord shape. So a little 
little bit awkward. I mean, this, this is the best way that I've found to do it. So I'm, I'm fretting these three notes with fingers two, three and four. Shifting up my little finger and then catching that A note with my first finger. That way you can get all of these notes chiming together nicely. Then I'm coming down to C sus2 and I'm just playing 5 and 5 on the D and G and then 3 on the top two strings and I'm picking then coming down to A sus2 and playing so I'm playing 2 on the D, 2 on the G top two strings and then just a little a little melody on the B string so and if I put all of that together So that would just be one way of doing it. You can hear lots of little variations on the recording. So I suggest listen to that, try and come up with some variations of your own. I will write out a few of those variations that I'm hearing in my tab if you want to check that out. So after the arpeggio section of the song, distortion comes back on and we're back to some simple chordal stuff. So... <laughs> So I'm hearing this as major bar chords uh, with six string root. We're playing basically playing E down to D down to C and then down to A. So interestingly we've kind of made all of these chords major here and I think Bernard is kind of hitting the, the lower strings most of the time. So sometimes it just sounds like a power chord but sometimes you can hear those higher notes coming through and uh, really just strumming down up in a kind of random way here with one bar on each chord. And I think we're repeating that twice. Then towards the end of the song we've actually got a bit of a guitar solo and we're kicking off with that opening riff repeated. So this riff playing that exactly as we just discussed. Then we're going higher up the neck and it's a little bit of a variation on this riff. So it's something like this. So, nice and simple. I'm going to go with note names here. So we've got E, E, D, E, E, B, and then D, E, E, F sharp, E, 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 F sharp. Then we're going a little bit higher and we've got another riff that goes like this. Again, I'm going to give you the note names here. You know it makes sense to learn the fretboard and learn those note names. So we've got um, F sharp twice E B E F sharp twice E F sharp so and we're just repeating that it's kind of alternating between the F sharp and the B as the ending note. In fact, on the recording, you can hear some double tracking. And on that final note of the phrase, one of the guitars is playing F sharp and one of them is playing B. So that the riff kind of breaks into harmony just for that one note. And then for the final section of the song, we've actually got that opening low E string riff played two octaves higher. And that sounds like this. So 
I've chosen to play this all on the B string. I mean, arguably it could be on, on the G string, but it sounds slightly more like the B string to me. It doesn't particularly matter. Again, in terms of note names, we've got E, F sharp, G, A, B, A, G, A, B, A, G, F sharp, G, E. can give some vibrato to some of those notes you can add in some little slides between some of those notes if you want to but that's the basic idea let me tell you a bit about this new guitar then and about the other stuff I'm using in this video so it so happens that because I'm a moderately successful youtuber and influencer occasionally companies will get in touch and say are you interested in using some of our stuff in one of your videos and your first thought is to think, wow, that's amazing, send me the free stuff. But the fact is that most of the time I say no to these companies simply because I don't want to be using gear just for the sake of it if it's something that I'm not into and I don't want to compromise my integrity in that kind of way. But in the case of Shergold guitars, I said yes because I got a good feeling from the company and I think this is a genuinely interesting guitar and I think it suits the kind of music that I play. So if you've not heard of Shergold before, they were a guitar company in the 80s and early 90s, famously associated with people like Mike Rutherford of Genesis, uh, Julian Cope, I think, and uh, Bernard Sumler, obviously, of, of Joy Division. And I always thought they were kind of really cool, quirky looking guitars. They went out of business sometime in the late 90s. And what I hadn't realised is that the Shergold brand recently has been relaunched and I should say that they're not just reissuing the old guitar designs I think the two guitars they've got available at the moment are completely new designs and this particular model I think is called the Provocateur so it's early days for me with this guitar but so far my impressions have been really positive I like the way it looks I think it's got that slight quirkiness of the earlier Shergold designs uh, but it also looks quite retro and, and classic as well. Somebody said to me that it reminded them of a Gibson Marauder, which I always thought was a, a quite a cool looking guitar. But um, I think other than the body shape, it's got not much in common with that guitar. It's a very modern, easy to play guitar, I think. Um, it's set up really nicely, straight out of the box. Intonation is great, holds its tuning well. And I think my favorite thing about it is this unusual combination of pickups. We've got a humbucker in the bridge, P90 in the neck and there's also this push-pull thing so you can split the coils on the, the humbucker and um, for, for me it's got a really nice kind of punky post-punk sound I think it will work well for that kind of stuff um, also sure it will work well for other styles and, and more bluesy stuff but I've kind of yet to put it through its paces properly but um, I hope you'll be seeing me using this guitar in the future just kind of hoping they're not going to ask for it back on to the other gear i'm using in this video amp is an ac30 it's a reissue ac30 top boost from sometime in the 1990s i'm using three pedals today distortion is coming from my rat pedal and that's kind of my go-to distortion for songs in this kind of style also using some chorus and you can definitely hear some chorus or some modulation on bernard sumner's tone in this song so i'm using my ibanez chorus mini pedal rather than my usual boss ce2 not for any particular reason it's just the ibanez fell out of my pedal cupboard the first and they're both great sounding pedals and also using a bit of delay so on the arpeggio section of the song i'm switching to the the middle position on the pickup selector for most of the tune i'm using the bridge pickup for the clean stuff i'm flipping into the middle so that the humbucker and the p90 are on at the same time I'm kicking in the delay, and the delay is the Catlin Bread Belle Epoque Deluxe, which is a fabulous pedal, and uh, they didn't send me that for free, incidentally. Uh, I paid for that with my own money. So that's it. As usual, the tab and the backing track will be up on my Patreon page, and on my Patreon page, I operate a kind of Radiohead-style pay-what-you-want policy. So even if you haven't got loads of money to commit to subscriptions every month, you can just pay a pound or a dollar a month, and you can still get access to all of the extra stuff that accompanies each of my videos. So check that out if you want to. I shall see you next week. Bye.